Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sun and Fun 2008. We had a beautiful morning this morning with more than 20 balloons going across the sky on a beautiful still morning. Tom Marcotte, our speaker this morning, is with the Light Sport Branch for aircraft certification. Tom's been an airworthiness inspector for more than 21 years, and he's certified in both rotor ring and fixed wing. He's only been with this new job for six months, and he's excited because he's learning new things, something that keeps him young, keeps us all young. Tom is excited about the way the new aircrafts are, aircraft are configured, the high wing, the low wing, the open cockpit. And this job is a learning situation for him and an exciting one. As his job continues, he will be looking at the light train sport, um, training centers, light sport training centers, to be sure that the training that light sport people are getting is appropriate and adequate to the work you're doing. It's an exciting field. It's one that is evolving, and we need all of us together to make this work. Tom has a lot of information for you this morning. So if during his presentation a burning question comes, we really want you to raise your hand, and we'll come to you with the microphone, ask your question. So Tom has an opportunity to really give you an answer on the spot. Please welcome our speaker this morning, Tom Marcotte. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning and uh, welcome to everyone here. We, uh, this is a new experience for me to make a presentation like this. And uh, As Christine says, we want to talk this morning about the uh, light sport aircraft certification and also we want to talk about the repairman certification for light sport aircraft. Uh, my background, as she stated, uh, I've got 21 years with the FAA but only six months in this branch. And I've worked on both rotary wing and fixed wing aircraft uh, in the Army Reserve for 16 years. So uh, I have been around smaller aircraft, but nothing this small in the past. Uh, you know, the FAA has a regulation for everything. And uh, the regulation that covers the light sport aircraft certification is uh, 21190 uh, and 21191. Also, there's instructions on how to do all of these things, and that's in the FAA Order 8130.2F. Excuse me. But the first thing we want to do is find out what, an, what a light sport aircraft is. And there's some things in here that uh, they're kind of hidden when you, uh, when you first read these definitions. And this is in part one uh, of the Federal Aviation Regulations. And I'm going to read this to you. It says, light sport aircraft means an aircraft other than a helicopter or a powered lift that since its original certification has continued to meet the following. Now, before we give you this criteria, I want to uh, emphasize here that where it says that since its original certification. And you may think that, well, you know, light sport aircraft is brand new. Uh, there weren't any uh, certificated aircraft before light sport come about that, work, that would work as a light sport aircraft. But we will look at that again later also because there are, are some aircraft that can be flown by sport pilots that are already certificated today. But the definition of a light sport aircraft is has a maximum t takeoff weight of 1,320 pounds. Uh, or 1,430 pounds for operation over water. It has a maximum uh, airspeed and level flight with, mac with continuous power of 120 knots. Uh, it doesn't give you a VNE speed for the light sport aircraft, but there is a VNE speed for gliders, which is 120 knots. The aircraft uh, has to have a stall speed of uh, 40, maximum of 45 knots without lift enhancing devices. The aircraft can only have a capacity of two persons, including the pilot. It has, to, it has to have a single reciprocating engine if powered. Now, in the preamble to the regulation, it, there's some comments in there about reciprocating engines, and it includes the Wankel engine and diesel engines. So therefore, Wankel engines are included and diesel engines are included if you can ever find one uh, light enough to, to put in an aircraft. Another thing that has come about in the last you know, few months of, of these type of aircraft are electric aircraft. Uh, we looked at one a few days ago that 
Uh, this thing had an 18 horsepower electric motor with a bunch of batteries below the seat. You know, this does not fit into the light sport category because of the regulation says it has a, have to have a reciprocating engine. Uh, it may not fit into the ultralight category uh, because it's over the 254 pounds because of the multitude of batteries that it has on it. So uh, the electric aircraft, uh, it, this is a trike that, that, that was, had this electric power, may have to go into the experimental amateur built category. The propeller on these aircraft has to be fixed pitch or ground adjustable uh, if a powered aircraft other than a glider and it has to be fixed pitched or auto feathering if it's on a glider. That means anytime the engine is shut down, whether intentionally or if they have an engine failure, the, the prop has to feather on this thing. Uh, the gyroplane has to have a, semi, uh, have a fixed pitch, semi-rigid, teetering, two-blade rotor system. If you have a cabin on this aircraft, it cannot be pressurized. Uh, the aircraft has to have a fixed landing gear except for an aircraft in intended for operation on water or a glider. The, these exceptions uh, are if, if it has a hull on it, it, I mean if it's a water operation it can have a hull uh, or it have, can re have re retractable landing gear. The picture that you see up there is one that has a hull on it. Uh, there's been some discussion about if you have a trolling motor on this hull to get you around uh, while you're on the lake going out to where you want to take off, whether that's a 20 engine vehicle or not. Uh, and I don't know what the outcome of that is. We've, there's been some discussion about it and uh, you're actually not powering the aircraft with the trolling motor, you're just uh, moving the aircraft around the water. Uh, it can have a retractable landing gear if it's a glider and it, or can be fixed. Another thing that we want to look at here is going back to these aircraft the, that were certificated before light sport that qualify for light sport is there's no mention here of the, of the type of airworthiness certificate in this definition of light sport. <coughs> Excuse me. When you look at the different types of uh, light sport aircraft, we have the uh, the single, uh, single engine land, uh, the one up on the left is a uh, primary uh, aircraft, it's a J3 Cub. The one on the right there is the, uh, the ultralight-like two place that was used as a trainer before light sports came about. Of course then on the lower left is the uh, SLSA or the, the consensus standard aircraft. You can have the lighter than air aircraft, uh, glider both powered and non-powered and the gyroplane. Uh, the gyroplane cannot be an SLSA because there are no accepted consensus standards for gyroplane aircraft at this time. Uh, so that, that can only be the experimental uh, aircraft. Uh, the two newest categories in, the, in light sport are the weight shift control and the powered parachute. Uh, matter of fact, I just took my first ride in a, in a weight shift control just a, a day or two ago and uh, it's really exciting to me. I flew in powered parachutes back in the early 90s, but uh, the, these two type of aircraft are the newest types in the light sports category and they're, they're a lot of fun. Uh, what is not a light sport aircraft? When you look at the things that cannot be light sport aircraft that somebody might want to make a light sport aircraft, if it qualifies for a 103 uh, ultralight, it cannot be a, a light sport aircraft. Something has to be changed on it to make a light sport. Uh, whether powered or unpowered, the hang gliders, paragliders, and training exemption holders cannot be light sport. Also, multi-engine aircraft, uh, powered lift helicopters, or complex aircraft with retractable gear, except those working over water or a glider. Also, if you have a propeller that's controllable pitch inside the cockpit, you can't uh, make that a light sport aircraft. The training exemption that was in effect uh, for a number of years for the uh, ultralight-like aircraft or what they call the fat ultralight no longer exists. That went uh, out January the 31st, 2008. So people who did not get their aircraft converted or registered, and certif or registered by, 2000, by January 31, 2008 uh, no longer have the opportunity to make these a light sport aircraft. There are three possibilities. Uh, for an aircraft to be a light sport aircraft, and this is where we're going to talk in about the, the certification of the aircraft. 
There's the SLSA, which is a special light sport aircraft. Uh, this is a new aircraft manufactured to the industry developed consensus standards. And these standards are accepted by the FAA, they're not approved. It's kind of like the automotive industry where they have standards that they build their automo air, automobiles to and they are self-regulated in, in keeping these things up to the standards. Uh, these aircraft are ground tested and flight tested and delivered to the customer in a ready to fly condition and they may be used for compensation or hire in training and towing or, or for rent. There's five classes of the light sport, the LSS, SLSA, that's the airplane, the glider, the weight shift control, powered parachute, and lighter than air. I thought there was a question here, but there's not. Uh, another, the second of the three possible categories are the ones that we call the I aircraft. Uh, in the regulation 21-191, there's an I-1 and an I-2 and an I-3 aircraft. The I-1 aircraft are the aircraft not previously certificated that do not meet the definition of 103. Again, these are, the, are normally the ones that were flying under the uh, exemption for training under the light sport category, the two-place aircraft. And also, again, they uh, had to be registered by January 31, 2008. And at that time, this exemption no longer exists. The second uh, possibility for certification of light sport aircraft is the, the new aircraft assembled from a kit that meet a consensus standard. Now, a, a, a new consensus, consensus standard kit has to be a part-for-part, part, bolt for bolt duplicate of a special light sport aircraft. A company has to get certification of a light sport aircraft uh, under 21190. Then they can make all the parts and all the bolts and everything and sell it as a kit. One of the things it does not have to do, it does not have to meet the amateur built standard where you're over 51%. Uh, the, the customer and the, the manufacturer determine to what extent this kit is involved or how much has to be done to put this kit together. The third uh, possibility for the uh, experimental is the aircraft that were previously certificated in the special light sport category and they are converted to experimental light sport category and there are a number of reasons for that to happen. One of them is if the person no longer wants to maintain the aircraft as a special light sport, he can uh, have it certificated as an experimental light sport. Uh, the second uh, possibility is where the manufacturer of the original special light sport aircraft has gone out of business, uh, has not designated someone to take over the uh, the production of parts or to, to keep these things in the air and no one has voluntarily come forward to to help keep this aircraft in the special light sport category and they are automatically converted to the experimental light sport aircraft. In the experimental light sport aircraft area there's there's the same categories uh, of aircraft that is in the, the special except for the experimental can have the gyroplane in it because it, the consensus standard is not accepted there. The third possibility is the previously certificated aircraft. And this is what we referred to in the very beginning when it talked about the, uh, the previously certificated aircraft, uh, the standard category aircraft, there are some that meet the light sport definition the J3 Cub, the Champ, uh, and there's, well, there's a list of them on, on our website out there of the ones that meet this. Also, the primary, primary category aircraft, such as the Quicksilver and the Rams meet it. Experimental category, uh, amateur built and exhibition, also, some of them also fall into the, the light sport uh, definition. Uh, these aircraft that meet the definition of light sport aircraft but are in the primary or the standard or the experimental category can be operated by a light sport pilot because they meet the definition. However, they cannot be recertificated as light sport aircraft. If you remember a few slides back, we talked about aircraft that were non-certificated could become light sport in the, uh, the I-1 exemption or I-1 uh, regulation. Uh, another thing that when we think about this, the, the fact that these aircraft that are in the primary or, or standard or experimental category uh, is just an added benefit 
to the definition of the rule. Uh, the rule was originally designed just to cover the, the exemption aircraft or the, the aircraft that were uh, the two-place trainers. And the fact that these others fall into that category now, as far as the weight category and the power and everything, is just a secondary benefit. The airworthiness certificate uh, for the special light sport aircraft is a little bit different than the certificate for the, the experimental. If we look at the category of the uh, special light sport air, uh, aircraft, it, it says the, the category is light sport aircraft and the purpose is whether it is weight shift in this case, it can be powered parachute, airplane, glider, or whatever. Of course, the airworthiness certificate has the, the normal information on it, the N number, the serial number, the builder, uh, the model, the date of issuance, and the expiration date. If you'll notice this one, uh, the Special Life Sport aircraft has an unlimited expiration date. Uh, when you have a Special Airworthiness Certificate, you also have to have operating limitations on what the aircraft can and cannot do. Anytime you have a Special Airworthiness Certificate or a pink Airworthiness Certificate, it has, it has to have operating limitations. Uh, we're going to go into one of these operating limitations in a few minutes uh, because it's, it's the one that's going to expire uh, in January 31, 2010. And we're going to get into that on this airworthiness certificate. If you look at this certificate, it has the same information except for the category is called experimental. The purpose is operating light sport and in the WSC is weight shift control or it could have PPC for powered parachute or airplane or glider. Also it has the same information as the end number, the builder, the serial number, the model. On this case the expiration date is January 31, 2010. So you know from looking at this airworthiness certificate that it has an operating limitation of training on it. Uh, again operational limitations are required anytime there's a pink airworthiness certificate and this is this is the uh, the limitation 13 this is kind of small so I'm going to read you exactly what this says uh, if the aircraft has experimental life support operating limitation number 13 which says no person may operate this aircraft for compensation or hire except this aircraft may be used for compensation or hire to conduct flight training in accordance with 91319E until January 31, 2010, at which time this airworthiness certificate on and operating limitation expires. So if your operating, I mean, if your airworthiness certificate expires, you no longer can fly this aircraft. But the operation limitation number 13 must be removed prior to January 31, 2010 by requesting amended operating limitations through your local flight standing and district office. If this is not accomplished, the airworthiness certificate expires and the aircraft cannot be recertificated as a light sport aircraft. This is a fact that needs to be disseminated to all the people in the light sport arena uh, that makes sure that everybody who has training uh, on their operating limitations that they know that they have to get this done before January 31, 2010. When we look at this picture right here, we appear to have three identical aircraft, uh, and the aircraft in looks may be, the, may be exactly the same, but we have, again, the I category aircraft. The I-1 is the existing fleet. The aircraft, which could have been an exemption trainer, uh, it can be used for flight training until January uh, 31, 2010. The next category is the kit, the consensus standard aircraft, built from an SLSA model. Uh, it cannot be used for flight training, for compensation or higher. Then you have the, uh, the aircraft that was changed from special to, to experimental. Again, it cannot be used for training uh, for compensation or higher. Yes, I have a question here in the front. Yeah, who would be the manufacturer for the experimental? Uh, do we have someone with a microphone? Yeah, who would be the manufacturer for the experimental? Would the, be, be the kit manufacturer be like for the experimental amateur build? Uh, uh, you're talking about the, the top one there? No, the, the experimental. Well, all, all of these are exper experimental aircraft. Okay, but if I bought the kit from the manufacturer, would I be the manufacturer of it or would the kit? 
manufacturer on the air whether on the consensus that. standard it would I believe that would be the the manufacturer of the kit I've got another question but I'm, I'm gonna have to think about that one about how it's registered it may be that you're that it's registered as your kit not the manufacturer you would be the right Had another question back back there. backtracking just a little bit to the airworthiness certificate if you have one of the cert, uh, certified aircraft like a, a uh, air coupe right uh, and it has its own airworthiness certificate does that stand uh, in effect with okay the, the original airworthiness certificate right. will, will stay into effect you won't have any changes as far as your your maintenance requirements because it is a standard category aircraft right but it qualifies for a light sport to fly that aircraft because it meets the definition of the the maximum weight the maximum speed everything Correct. so nothing changes on the certification but it is eligible for light sport pilot okay thank you i may have an answer to your question in these slides uh, and, and if not, then after this is over, then let's get together and, and discuss that. I've got three guys in the back there that are that work in the same office, and they can help me get answers to these. Now, the the flight training for compensation or hire is available on the I-1 aircraft. Those are the exemption aircraft, uh, and also towing for compensation or hire. Now, if you get your operating limitations amended by January uh, 31, 2010, uh, you cannot, can no longer do flight training, but your towing does not expire. You can still do towing after that time frame. Uh, each experimental aircraft has to have a program letter uh, stating the purpose uh, of the aircraft, such as operating light sport and flight training. Uh, aircraft in the I-1 category when they're going for certification, they will have a, an operating limitation on there of the flight test. And you have to designate a flight test area. Usually it's for five hours, uh, even though some aircraft may have existing time on it. It's not absolutely necessary to have the flight test area on uh, the I-1 aircraft, but if you don't do the, the flight test area, and you want to make a modification on that aircraft, then you have to go to your flight standards district office and get it, uh, your operating limitations amended to put the flight test area on it. So the best thing to do is to get your uh, flight test area on your original operating limitations. Then if you change a prop or something like that on the aircraft that's a major uh, re uh, modification, your, your test flight area is already designated you make your, your modification, you go out and do your five hours of test flight, you sign it off and you're ready to go again. So it's a lot more convenient to, to whoever does your original certification to have those, that operating limitation on there rather than six months later or a year later have to go back to the FISDO and get this added to your operating limitations. Uh, the identification on the light sport aircraft, uh, the SLSA airplane has to have 12 inch letters or as large as practical. Uh, the other end numbers on the experimental life sport aircraft uh, and on the SLSAs that are not airplanes have three inch letters. Also there's placarding that's required on the life sport aircraft on the SLSA uh, by the door or close to it on, around the door somewhere it has to say light sport if it's an experimental aircraft, it has to have the word experimental on it. And this is referenced in uh, AC 45-2. Uh, there's also some requirements for the, uh, the, the, when you say the three inch letters or the 12 inch letters, there's some dimensions in the 45-2, which gives you that the letter has to be two thirds as wide as it is, is tall and, and some information like that. So before you put your in number on there, you need to look at the dimensions of the aircraft or the in number and the spacing of the numbers. I've seen some of them where they're jammed right close together and they're not readable from a, from a specified distance. Uh, so we want to look at all that before you put your document, I mean, your identification on the aircraft. These two aircraft, if they look to be the same type of aircraft, the top one is an experimental aircraft and you see that on the bottom of the tail, it's not real visible, but it has the three inch in numbers on it. 
the bottom one is the special life support aircraft and it, it has the large end numbers on the airplane. And that has to be 12 inches or as large as practicable. If you could put if you couldn't put more than a 10 inch letter on there then that would be acceptable uh, but in most cases you can get the 12 inch letters on the aft part of the fuselage. Uh, aircraft also has to have to have an identification plate. This plate must be fireproof. It must be attached to a m structural member behind the passenger door. Uh, that's one of the things that we've run across on a lot of aircraft. They put these on the framework up uh, by the cockpit or something like this, but the, the order says that they will be behind the passenger door. They have to be etched, stamped, engraved, or marked by another approved fireproof marking, something that is not going to come off of there if the airplane aircraft crashes, uh, you can still identify the aircraft with the data plate. One of the things that we've seen on some of the aircraft is uh, they will, it has to be attached to a structure member, but there may not be a place, a good place to attach it, so they'll use ADEL clamps and, uh, and attach these to the, uh, to the frame with ADEL clamps. If you have two ADEL clamps to holding the data plate, that's sufficient also. So long as they won't come off in a crash uh, or in a fire. The information that's required on the data plate is the manufacturer or kit builder, not the designer or plans producer. That, that, that's the answer to your question that I was thinking was there. The manufacturer is who built the kit, not the manufacturer of the kit or the designer of the kit. Uh, it has, has the model designation and the serial number. And again, all of these have to be uh, either embossed in or stamped in or something in the data plate uh, so that it is not made unrecognizable in a crash or a fire. Uh, there are requirements for emergency locator transmitter on some light sport aircraft, but only on the airplane uh, and only if this aircraft is designed to operate with more than one person. Uh, it's not required. Uh, until after the test flight, but after the test flight, a two-place airplane requires an emergency locator transmitter. Imported aircraft. Imported aircraft have the same requirements as the American aircraft. Uh, as far as the consensus standard, uh, the manufacturer will issue a statement of compliance uh, for your aircraft by or kit by the serial number. So they have to have the a cons a statement of compliance from the manufacturer before it can be registered and certificated in this country. Uh, there are additional requirements on imported aircraft that uh, these are that the aircraft uh, or aircraft assembled from a kit must be eligible for an airworthiness certificate in the country of manufacturer, meaning that if the country does not allow this aircraft to be registered and certificated in their own country, we're not going to accept it in our country. Also, the country must have an agreement uh, with the FAA that covers the import and export of aircraft. Next, we're going to get into the uh, certification of repairmen. Uh, what we have here is a picture of a, uh, an air creation just coming out of the kit to being assembled here. Uh, the uh, regulations covering the certification of repairmen is uh, uh, 14 CFR 65-107 and the order covering this is 8,000.84. All of these references that I'm giving to, to regulations and to orders are out on the internet. You can find them from our website. Uh, the repairman ratings, uh, there's an ins uh, a repairman inspection rating. Uh, it's to be eligible for an inspection rating, an individual must attend and successfully complete a 16-hour FAA accepted course. Uh, there's a maintenance rating. Uh, the person must attend and successfully complete an 80 to 120-hour course, depending on the class of life support aircraft. Uh, there's different requirements for a weight shift or for an airplane. The inspection rating, uh, in, in, the, in the airworthiness world, most of the time you think of a, a, re, 
of a, like an A&P mechanic and then an IA, which a, an IA can, can sign off things that the, uh, the A&P can do. In life sport, the inspection rating is limited uh, to one experimental aircraft that you own, and we'll cover that in just a minute. The course consists of six elements. Uh, there's a number of organizations that are giving these courses around the nation, uh, and you can find these on our website also. Uh, the, the first element of, of this inspection rating is, covers the regulations and guidance material applicable to light sport aircraft, uh, review of operating limitations, uh, condition inspections, uh, the way to uh, record entry and review of ADs, and manufacturer safety directives. Uh, one of the things that, since this is not a T-seat aircraft, the question comes up, why do you have to worry about airworthiness directives? Because airworthiness directives are designed for uh, T-seat aircraft or P-seat aircraft. But if you have a, a light sport aircraft with a TC PC engine on it, uh, even though it is a light sport aircraft you, and you don't have to comply with airworthiness directives, how are you going to sign this aircraft off as being safe on a TC engine if you haven't completed the ADs ap applicable to that engine? So you, normally you wouldn't consider ADs on these aircraft, but to, but if you have a TCPC engine, then you have to look at those before you can sign it off as airworthy. Uh, manufacturer safety directives come out from uh, like uh, Rotax or whoever the engine manufacturer is, Hearth or some of these that, that you have to comply with also. And it also has to comply with all the consensus standards. You can't do any modifications uh, that uh, do not have these. Uh, the, the second element is the inspection procedures. Uh, Advisory Circular 4313-1B uh, gives acceptable methods, techniques, and practices in aircraft inspection and repair, and the use of manufacturer's manuals, technical data, and personal safety in the work environment. So there's the first two elements of the uh, uh, inspection rating. Uh, the third one, uh, aircraft theory of flight and discussion of aircraft systems. Uh, uh, theory of flight, most everybody's gone through that when they started work getting an aircraft. Uh, if they don't learn theory of flight, they don't fly for very long. Uh, these include the proper operation of critical areas that are prone to failure and fatigue. Uh, these system includes the airframe, uh, including the instrumentation, the landing gear, uh, the brakes, including the fuel and oil systems, uh, the propeller with the gear reduction unit, accessories including the uh, ballistic parachute, and flight control operation and rigging. So this is the the third element of the inspection rating, it's, it's probably one of the larger elements that gets you doing the, the actual condition inspection for the aircraft. Oops, let's back up one. Uh, element number four is use of an inspection checklist. Uh, it's always good to have a checklist to, uh, to go through the process of doing your inspection. Uh, and usually the manufacturer will provide you with a checklist to do this. Uh, if not, you have FAA AC 90-89A, which is the amateur-built uh, aircraft and ultraflight, ultralight flight testing handbook. In Appendix A, it has a checklist in there. The fifth element is the student course evaluation. Now, you may think this is an odd element for a training f uh, course, but it is critical. If you don't complete this, you don't complete the course. Uh, every student has to do the critique of the course. Uh, not only in the, uh, the content of the course, but the facility that it's given at, the equipment that they have to look at. Uh, and the reason they do this is these evaluations are sent into AFS 610 back in Oklahoma City. And we look at these at the evaluations to determine if the training facility is doing the job that they're supposed to be doing. And if they're doing it in an efficient and uh, manner that, that gets these people the training that they need. The final element of the uh, uh, inspection uh, course is the final test. It has 50 questions, multiple choice, uh, four questions in each uh, subject area. The minimum passing grade is 80%. So it's a pretty rough test. It's, uh, you know, once you get through with this and you pass it, then, then you will be well qualified to, to do the uh, annual condition inspection on your aircraft. 
If you don't complete the course, you can't go back and just take a certain portion of the course. You have to take the whole course all over again. Uh, light support repairman with an inspection rating will allow the repairman to perform the annual condition inspection on the experimental aircraft owned by him or her. So this is, this is aircraft specific. It gives the, the class, the registration number, and the serial number that you can do the inspection on. If you sell this aircraft, you can no longer do the inspection on this aircraft. Whoever uh, buys the aircraft can go to the course and get uh, qualified to do the inspection on this aircraft, or you can have an A&P do it. Uh, the maintenance rating, uh, the courses go from, from 80 to 120 hours, depending on what course you have. They have all of the five different ratings uh, for airplane, power, uh, airplane uh, weight shift, uh, powered parachute, glider, and lighter than air. Uh, so there's five elective courses that you can take, and you don't have to take all of them. You can take the core courses plus one of the electives gets you for a repairman for a specific class of aircraft. Uh, it's designed in modules of instructions and customized uh, for the specific type of aircraft. Uh, the three core uh, modules are, include the airframe, uh, the uh, well regu regulation, the airframe, and, and engine. Uh, we'll get that to a minute. Uh, there, like I said a fall ago, there's five classes eligible for maintenance rating. That's the airplane, weight shift, powered parachute, lighter than air, and glider. There is no maintenance rating for a gyroplane. Uh, gyroplane is, is strictly an experimental aircraft, and the maintenance rating course is designed for the special light sport aircraft. Uh, the, there's a limit on the number of students in a, in a course to, to get the, the level standard uh, level three standard training, have a maximum of 16 students per instructor on the lecture part of the class and eight students per the practical projects. And of course, if you have, if this course is given in a, a 147 school, that number can be raised. <coughs> Excuse me. As I said, the maintenance rating uh, has got six, mo or got modules to it. Uh, there's a regulation and, and maintenance overview, which is a 16-hour core module. Everyone who goes for a, a maintenance rating has to go through this module. Module number two is the airframe. It's 24 hours. And it says it must cover at least two representative aircraft for the practical session. So the provider of the course has to have two airframes there to, uh, to work on to uh, get your maintenance rating in this uh, class of aircraft. Module three, engine and propeller, which is 45 hours. It's also a core module. Uh, this, must, this covers at least, must have at, three, at least three representative engines. It has one water cool two cycle, one air cool two cycle, and one four cycle engine. But now this module, even though it is a core module under most circumstances, it's not required for non-powered gliders. Module four is the airplane class, it's 35 hours. Uh, again, the must cover at least two representative airframes uh, not produced by the same manufacturer. Uh, the same thing for module five, the weight shift, but it's a 19 hour course elective uh, if you're going for weight shift control aircraft. Uh, module six, powered parachute, 19 hours uh, elective. Again, has to have two representative aircraft not produced by the same manufacturer. Uh, lighter than air, this is a 64 hour elective module. Uh, must have one, at least one representative aircraft. Module 8 is the glider class, it's 40 hours and it's also elective. Must have at least one representative aircraft. Now here, if the applicant wishes to be rated on gliders with a retractable or fixed engine, uh, Module 3 must also be uh, completed. So if you're going for non-powered glider, you do 1, 2, and 8. If you're going to, for a powered glider, you have to do 1, 2, 3, and 8. That's where you get the, the really long training courses. The holder of a repairman certificate with a maintenance rating, a proven return to service a, a special life support aircraft or any part thereof after performing and inspecting maintenance uh, to include the annual condition inspection and 100 hour inspections, uh, also line maintenance, preventative maintenance or, alter, or alterations excluding 
major repair or major alteration on a product produced uh, uh, under the FAA approval of an SLSA aircraft. Also, the, the maintenance rating individual may perform annual condition inspection on an experimental light sport aircraft uh, that has been issued an experimental certificate under 21191I. That's whether it's on I-1, I-2, or I-3. There is only one uh, repairman certificate. It, all of your ratings will be put on that one certificate. Uh, the front, it will have your information about yourself, uh, you know, and your certificate number and all that. On the back of the rating, uh, the top of it here, it says inspection rating. Uh, and if you look at, if he has an inspection, it'll, t down in the limitations, it'll give you what that inspection rating is for. And on, in this particular instance, it's for a weight shift control in number 337EF, serial number 18-337. So he can only do inspections on that one aircraft, and he can only do inspections on that one aircraft as long as he owns it. Once he sells that aircraft, then he can no longer do the inspection on that aircraft. The new person uh, either has to get their own inspection certificate or have an A&P do the inspection. The second rating here is a maintenance rating. He has a maintenance rating in powered parachutes. He can do any powered parachute. It's not limited to something that he, he owns. Uh, so it's, the maintenance rating is, is a much broader rating. Uh, this is my contact information to uh, to get in touch with myself or anyone in our branch. Uh, I'm not going to read all this to you. There's the, the main number that we call there is at the top is 405-954-6500. Uh, 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 we're going to leave this up here for a few minutes because we're just about finished. Uh, there is an e uh, email address there that you can email questions or the mailing address there. Uh, my presentation is over. I want to talk about the, the have three operations uh, inspectors in the back of the class here, uh, uh, Rich Michaels, Jim Lamb, and, and Robbie Whitesell. Uh, they can help me with any questions in the operational side of the house if you have any questions. So at this time, I want to, to say if you have any more questions, let's get them asked and we'll, we'll see if we can get you some answers from it. Okay, uh, right here in the front. What, what's an AMP need to do to do the maintenance and the inspection? An A and P? Yeah. A and P can do the maintenance and inspection on the aircraft. Uh, now, there are some limitations to what an A and P can do. Uh, Rotra Rotax has come out and said that anyone who's going to sign off a Rotax engine has to go to the Rotax school. So you can't do uh, a, a sign off on a Rotax engine return to service unless you've been to that school. Also, in the SLSA aircraft, they have a, the the manufacturer designates in his manual what can be done and who can do it. Uh, if he says that an, an SLSA repairman uh, can do this work, uh, like changing a tire, and he didn't include uh, an A&P or something like that, then an A&P can't do that work. No. That's correct. Uh, and you know, when we talked about the, uh, they got back with the manufacturers and. Uh, and said, well, why did you limit this just to the repairman? They said, well, we meant repairman or hire. Well, there is no hire in the airworthiness side of the house. The, the certificate for an airworthiness is not like an operational certificate. When you have an operational certificate, you could have a uh, rec pilot, private pilot, commercial pilot, and ATP. And an ATP can do anything a private can. Uh, it can do anything a rec pilot can. But in the airworthiness side of the house, you have to have an, an A&P, uh, you have a separate uh, repairman certificate, you have a separate IA, uh, so it's not on the same certificate. So if the manufacturer in his manual does not state that an A&P can do this, he can't do it. Uh, and some of the manufacturers are, all, are looking at this and going to, probably going to be changing their manuals. Yeah, that, that probably needs to come out in an AC or some other order so AMPs really know what they can do what they can't do, and because there's a lot, I know there's a lot of confusion out there. I'm an AMP, uh -huh. and the guys I talk to, a lot of them don't even want to do it because they don't want to, you know. Well, see, it's, it's really up to the manufacturer who they want to do this work. Uh, to give you an example, there, we have a, uh, a weight shift back in Oklahoma City that there are operations inspectors fly, and in the, the maintenance manual for that aircraft, it says that a repairman uh, 
can change the tire. Now, if they have a flat on that aircraft, these guys can't change it as the pilot. I can't go out there as an A&P and change it. We have to get a repairman or a representative from the manufacturer to come into Oklahoma City and change that tire. Uh, and and th it was just a misunderstanding of the, of the way that the certificates work on the part of the manufacturer. Because if, you know, if they thought it would meant repairman or higher, then, a, then an A&P could do it. But well, like I said, there's, there's no hierarchy of uh, ratings in the airworthiness side of the house. So they have to state A&P or maintenance. Yeah. Who's ever maintenance qualified for it. Okay, I uh, got a question back. Well, Rich is up here. Uh, the uh, um, one thing that we that uh, we've talked about is whenever an AMP is doing work on a light sport aircraft, that they call the manufacturer if they can't find that information because all they would need is just a, usually in most cases the manufacturer is willing to have the AMP do the work. They would just end up uh, getting a faxed letter of authorization saying yes, the AMP can work on it, and then they, that would go ahead. That's the way we tell. The MPs now, right now, is to contact the manufacturer on whatever aircraft they're going to be working on to get approval. And there would have to be no previous training or anything like that. If the manufacturer says that there was no previous training, then that would be that would be that correct. Would it's all it's all up to the manufacturer of that aircraft. And that would apply for a condition inspection also. If the manufacturer says the condition inspection, yes. Okay. Yep. How about in general with a condition inspection? What do you mean in general? For an AMP to do a condition inspection. Yes, the manufacturer says so. As long as it's either in the book or you get yes. certain, okay. Yep. Can we, when we get that, Michael, we, I, we couldn't hear the last part of those questions. Uh, would you repeat that last question that you asked, Rick? I, I, yeah, um, for the condition inspection, what the AMP needed to do for a condition inspection. And the same thing, get uh, okay from the manufacturer. Right, okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, Robbie, uh, let's get your microphone back there. Just a comment, uh, Tom. I just wanted to make sure that uh, the, the, they understand the phone number our, for our branch. Uh, it's the 6400. Um, I think you said 6500, and I wanted to make sure that they knew that oh, it was yeah, okay. uh, uh, 6400. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I want to tell you thank you very much for sharing this information. It went beautifully. And the people that were fortunate enough to be here have learned a great deal. Thank you Thank very you. much. We're going to switch over to Cheryl in Studio B and proceed on with a very special day at Sun and Fun. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Tom. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody who's interested in, in answering or talking to Tom personally, come on up. We'd like to stay here and see you and greet you. So come on, you will talk to you. Okay.